Hello, this is Jake Abbott. In this video, we're going to be talking about tracking of reference inputs. This video presumes that you've already watched and understand the video on state feedback. So in that video on state feedback, what we learned was that using state feedback, if our system is controllable, um, we can use state feedback and place the system's eigenvalues wherever we want. So from a stability, and time response point of view, that's good enough. We basically, if we can put the eigenvalues anywhere we want, then we can make our system stable and we can make have whatever time response we want. But that didn't ask the question, how, or answer the question, how do we make our output Y go to some value that we want? And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. So if you remember in that video, we were talking about a single input, single output system. So and in general, it could have it could have many states, so something like this, but we're only going to consider a single input and we're only going to consider a single output. And we forgot about the problem of the D. Having the D here, um, most systems don't have it and it's kind of trivial to include it, so let's just keep our conversation like this so it's nice and simple. So U and Y are both scalars here and the feedback law that we talked about was using changing U to be some reference minus some matrix k times our vector x and if you remember k was in this case a row vector that looked something like this where you had values like this and then our state vector looks something like this so that the combined thing is one by one so that you can subtract it from this thing which is one by one to make our one by one u so this was the state feedback law and we said if we do that we'll get this new system will fundamentally change our system properties and our system will look like A minus B times K. And if this doesn't look familiar to you, then please go back and review plus B times R. So we have this new, effectively new input R, which is the thing we now control. And, and we have a new A matrix and that A matrix we can place the eigenvalues wherever we want. Now let's say that we have placed those eigenvalues so that they're stable. So now we know this thing is stable. This is an n by n matrix that's stable. And if we know it's stable, that means all the eigenvalues have negative real parts, which means none of the eigenvalues are zero, which means the determinant is not zero. So this, this new A matrix is an invertible matrix. We know that. We also know that if we give a, some sort of input in R, a constant input, let's say, a step input, we know that because this is a stable matrix, that eventually the effect of the initial, the initial state will eventually decay away to zero because this A matrix is zero, uh, it is, is stable. And so this thing's going to decay away to zero, and eventually all we're going to be left with is our uh, forced response of our system. The natural response will eventually decay away. This is a property of stable systems that we've seen over and over in this class. And the fact that we have a, our, our new A matrix looks like A minus BK doesn't change that fact. This is just a new A matrix and we, we know how to deal with systems like this. So if I give a constant R, what's going to happen is eventually I'm going to go to some steady state x where x is going to stop evolving and I'm going to I'm going to go to this steady state x and what does steady state x mean what steady state x means is that x dot goes to 0 eventually now this is going to happen as time goes to infinity it's going to ha happen asymptotically so we're talking about now this asymptotic behavior but we know that in in practice it doesn't really take from time to infinity it really takes more like four or five time constants where you've effectively gone to your steady state value so that isn't time at infinity at all it could actually be really fast where to your eyes it looks like the system has stopped evolving and you've gone to steady state so in this case where we've gone to steady state, let's substitute this, this, this um, situation into our governing equation up here. So x dot has gone to zero, and I have a minus bk, and, and I, I'm sorry, this, there shouldn't have been a dot here. And our x goes to x steady state, and our r is whatever value we set it at. So after, 
after uh, four or five time constants of our system, our system will asymptotically approach this situation here. And in this situation, because I know this matrix is stable, which means it is invertible, so I can actually invert this matrix. So I'm going to bring this, this BR over to the other side, and then I'm going to invert this matrix. And what I'm going to get after I do that is I'm going to get a solution for what my steady state X is. It's going to equal minus A minus BK inverse times B times R. I brought this BR over to the other side, so it became a minus BR, and then I multiplied by on the left side by the inverse of A minus BK. So that's my steady state X value. And I can find my steady state Y value by just looking at Y is just C times X. So that just simply equals minus C times A minus BK inverse B R. So I now know the value that my Y will go to if I give it some R. It will go to R times this thing. And this thing is a one by one thing because because uh, C is a 1 by N thing, and this is an N by N thing, and this is an N by 1 thing. So this whole thing here, that's including the minus sign. Let's make that clear. This whole thing is a 1 by 1 scalar. It doesn't include the R, <laughs> like this. And we call this the DC gain of our system. So our steady state Y value and I shouldn't have made this a vector because it's just a scalar. Our steady state Y value is simply equal to the DC gain of our system times our reference. So from that, if you say, I have some desired steady state value that I want to go to, and you say, well, what should I make R? Well, if you want Y steady state to go to some value, the way that you should properly assign R is you should make R equal to your desired value over your DC gain. If you do that, then you'll plug in that R into here, and the two DC gains will cancel, and your steady state Y will be your desired Y. So now we have a way to establish how we should choose R. This is the way we should choose R to make our output go to where we want it to go. Now, if you're critical here, you can say, well, is R always well defined? And I think the answer pretty clearly is it's defined as long as our DC gain isn't zero. If our DC gain is zero, then my R would have to go to infinity for this to work. So this method that I've just shown you presumes that the DC, ga DC gain isn't zero. So the question is, is that a safe assumption to make? I think if you look down in the bottom left here, and you look at the way the DC gain is made, it seems completely possible that it could be zero. I mean, this is some n by n matrix, and depending on what my shape, what's in my b matrix, and depending on what's in my c matrix, I could easily imagine if there's some zeros in there in the right places, I could imagine this thing working out so stuff cancels each other out, and my DC gain could be zero. So it seems reasonable that my system potentially could have a zero DC gain, and then this process wouldn't work. It's typically not the case, but it seems possible. And so if we, if we look at our transfer function, so let's look at our transfer function of our system. In the state feedback uh, lecture, I was dealing with a three by three system. And so I'm gonna stick with that example here. So with my original A matrix, if I have a three by three A matrix, my characteristic equation that I'm gonna get is gonna look something like S cubed plus, I'm gonna have some alpha one S squared plus some alpha 2 times s plus some alpha 3. And if I actually go through, that's my characteristic equation, if I actually go through and find my transfer function, again with my d matrix uh, being 0, I'm going to get a strictly proper transfer function that looks something like, if I, if I write my transfer function out, my characteristic equation is going to be in the denominator of this. And the numerator is going to be something strictly proper. So that there's going to be an s squared term, and there's going to be an s term, and there's going to be a constant term. But um, 
the leading coefficient, even though I made the leading coefficient of my characteristic equation monic, meaning leading by one, that doesn't, that's not necessarily going to happen for the numerator. So let's call this some beta one, and let's call this some beta two, and then let's call this some beta three. So uh, it, for those of you who've had a class on uh, signals and systems, if you've taken a class on classical control systems, you'll remember that the DC gain is defined as g of s evaluated at s equals zero. And if I do that, this is the definition of a DC gain. If I do that and I plug in for every s I have in my transfer function, if I plug in a zero for the s, I see that my transfer function, or my DC gain, excuse me, is beta three over alpha three. And so, so right here you see, okay, I can see exactly that my DC gain can be zero and the way that my DC gain is zero is if beta three is zero. So GDC equals zero is the same thing as saying beta three is equal to zero. And so in if your transfer function, if the, if the final coefficient on your transfer function is a zero, then you're gonna have a DC gain of zero. And this method of tracking that we described in the last slide isn't gonna work for those systems. For that, that kind of system, um, we'll talk about that in the future. For most systems, that isn't going to be the case. That's not going to happen. And you, you're going to get something here that's a non-zero. And then the method for choosing R in order to make your output Y go to some desired YD uh, is going to work for you.